Welcome to Through the Bible with Les Feldick, a 30-minute walk through the Scriptures, teaching in-depth Bible truths that change people's lives. Now, here's your host, Les Feldick. Okay, there we are, and I always like to see that red light come on. Again, we're uh, glad to see everybody in this afternoon, and for those of you out in television, we again just want to welcome you to an informal Bible study. And I think most of you realize that we're not associated with any group. We are totally independent. And uh, we just rely on the Lord to lead us and direct us, as well as supply our every need. And uh, consequently, we do not appeal and beg for money. And uh, the Lord always seems to provide. And again, we appreciate the prayers of all of you out there for all of us as family and the ministry. And uh, we just give the Lord the glory and the credit. All right, for those of you here in the studio, we're going to go back to where we left off in Matthew 6. <clears throat> and again, for you out in television, where we are in the last four programs of book number 64. So mark that down and check it up here on the board. Okay, I think that's sufficient. Let's uh, jump right back where we left off in Matthew chapter 6, verse 33. And we were in our last program talking about the difference between the kingdom of God the kingdom of heaven, and we haven't mentioned it yet, but we will, and that is the body of Christ. I put the three on the board during our break, and uh, remember from our last half hour, I explained that if you will just draw a circle on your notepad and call the large circle the kingdom of God, that is that area of God's sovereignty and influence that includes everything in heaven, it includes the angelic hosts, it includes the believers, from day one to the end of time, it includes everything pertaining to the Word of God. It includes the body of Christ. It includes you and I as believers today. So as I said in the last program, when we sit down and talk about spiritual things, we are talking about things that pertain to the kingdom of God. On the other hand, within that circle of the kingdom of God, we have the kingdom of heaven, which is that earthly kingdom over which Christ will rule and reign from David's throne in Jerusalem. That's the kingdom of heaven, and we were looking at that when our time ran out. Then also, as we'll look at further down the line this afternoon, within that same circle you can also put the body of Christ. Now the body of Christ is that present-day outcalling of believers, and every true believer becomes then a member of the body of Christ. And since the body of Christ is in the kingdom of God, yes, we are associated with the kingdom. But our number one priority is not to fill the kingdom. I, it just almost irks me when I hear that constant over and over. We have to fill the kingdom. We have to work for the kingdom. No, we are working today to fill the body of Christ. Because when the body of Christ is full, we're out of here. It's just that simple. We're going to be raptured. And as I mentioned in the last program, that will probably be the thing that will trigger the fall of America so far as the nations of the world are concerned. Because when that many people will suddenly disappear, things are bound to happen. And uh, that, of course, is what we're hoping and praying for. But all right, let's come back to our verse where we took off. <clears throat> where after Jesus has made note of the fact that the lilies gain all their beauty without any outward energy, and uh, he's telling his Jewish listeners not to be so concerned with the physical and the material, but to have the number one priority is seek first the kingdom of God, and his righteousness. And then all these other things will be added. Of course, we have to have them. you got to have things or you won't survive. We have to have the wherewithal to keep a roof over our head. We have to have the wherewithal to buy our daily food and our clothing. And God knows that. But that's not to be our number one priority. All right, so now then we took off in our last program on delineating the kingdom of heaven as over against the kingdom of God. And we were back in Daniel's prophecy where he laid out the Gentile empires. Now let's go back to Daniel again and pick up where we left off concerning the kingdom of heaven 
that's going to be a veritable sovereign rule and reign of Christ on the planet. And he's going to be total sovereign God. All right, let's come back to Daniel 7 because we kind of had to wind it up quickly. Daniel 7, and drop in again at verse 13. Now this is a repetition of where we left off, but everybody keeps reminding me, even here in the studio, repeat, repeat, repeat. In fact, I guess Luther made it. He said, when I finally get so full up with your repetition that it makes me almost sick, that's when it finally clicks. <laughs> about, about right, Luther? And, and that's about it. You just have to have it pounded and pounded and pounded and all of a sudden. And these are the kind of phone calls we get. Less all of a sudden, it just opens up. Well, that's the way it works, see? All right, here we are. Daniel chapter 7, verse 13 where Daniel is now rehearsing his own vision concerning the end time. And he says, I saw in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man, that's of course God the Son, Jesus Christ of the New Testament, and he came with the clouds of heaven and came to the Ancient of Days, which is a reference to God the Father, and they brought him near before him. And now God the Father, in so many words, gives to him, verse 14, dominion and glory. Now, I didn't do this in the last program, but I'm going to do it now a minute. Who was first given dominion over this planet? Adam. Adam was given dominion over everything on the planet. Everything that lived and moved was under Adam's dominion. But he lost it because of his rebellion and ate of the tree. All right, so now here we are, some 6,000 or more years later, where the second Adam, as Paul refers to him, the second Adam is going to pick up that which Adam lost. And that's why we use the same word, dominion. All right, and so there was given to him a kingdom and dominion and glory. Now this is literal. Just read it for what it says, that all people and nations, plural, and languages will serve him. In other words, his kingdom is going to cover the whole globe, not just Israel, not just the Middle East. Israel will be the apple of his eye. Israel will be the top dog of the nations, if I may put it that way. But it's going to control the whole planet. And it's going to be glorious. It's going to be heaven on earth. But yes, there's going to be animals. There are going to be the lion and the wolf and the lamb and the goat and the kids and the children kids are going to be playing amongst them because it's going to be a glorious kingdom. Satan is locked up. There's no more sin or death or sickness. Heaven on earth. And that's why it's called then the kingdom gospel or the kingdom of heaven because it's going to be heaven on earth. All right, now then finish the verse. And this kingdom shall not pass away, and this is a kingdom which shall not be destroyed. Now, of course, like I mentioned in the closing seconds, Revelation puts a time frame on it, doesn't it? 1,000 years. But this says it's going to reign forever. All right, so what's going to happen? The 1,000 years will just slip right on into eternity. And uh, I remember reading a book years and years ago, and I guess it was appropriate that I read it when I did. And this was a uh, seminary professor who had his head on straight, and he put it this way, that the thousand-year kingdom reign of Christ is just sort of like kindergarten for a child. And you go from kindergarten right on into a higher level of everything. And that's what it's going to be. Because, you see, I always have to remember People will write with these questions. And the question was, just a couple weeks ago, well now, when the thousand years are over and we go into eternity, will everything come together and be mixed up as one? No, I don't think so. For the simple reason that when you get to Revelation chapter 21, and this whole system, I think the whole universe is going to go, what takes its place? New heavens and a new earth. Well, if it's all going to be mixed up, why keep the two entities separate? 
And so my own conviction, I can't prove this beyond where I'm showing you, is that even in eternity, God is still going to have Israel in the earthly realm and the body of Christ in the heavenly. Now, you don't have to buy that if you don't want to, but that would seem to indicate that he's always going to keep those two entities separate. All right, now then, let's just go a little further in the Old Testament. Come back with me to Isaiah now. Now, remember your prophets. Isaiah is the first of the major prophets. Daniel is the fourth. <clears throat> so come back to Isaiah now. Chapter 2, and with the description of Daniel, then this should make sense. <coughs> Daniel, chapter 2. I mean Isaiah. Thank you, Loretta. Isaiah, chapter 2, verse 1. The word that Isaiah the son of Amos saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. Now here it comes. And it shall come to pass. What does that mean? Maybe? No, it means it's going to. No ifs and buts about it. It's going to happen, because God has said it. That it shall come to pass in the last days, after all of human history has run its course, that the mountain, or the kingdom, of the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the kingdoms. Now, I told you in the last program, a mountain in Old Testament language is a kingdom. All right, this kingdom is going to be established as the top kingdom of the kingdoms. It shall be exalted above the hills, or the smaller kingdoms, or the other nations of the world. But this kingdom, with its capital, of course, at Jerusalem, all the nations will what? Flow into it. In other words, it's going to be the hub of all of the planet's activity. Jerusalem, where the king of kings will be ruling and reigning. All right, and so all nations shall flow into it. All right, now from Isaiah 2, let's just jump up to chapter 9. And the language is so self-explanatory, even though it's written 700 years before Christ, 2,700 years before our day and time. That's a long time ago. And look how accurately it is placed. Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6 and 7. Isaiah 9, chapter, uh, Isaiah chapter 9, verses 6 and 7. Verse 6, for unto us, the nation of Israel again, a child is born. Now that's a reference to Christ at Bethlehem. Unto us, a son is given. Well, beginning of his earthly ministry, even the book of John says what? He came unto his own. And who were his own? Israel. He came unto his own. See, he was given for their benefit. All right, now back to our text in verse 6. And the government. What's the purpose of government? Control the masses. Otherwise, you've got anarchy. Even in, a, even in an area like the heaven on earth, you have to have control of the masses. So he's going to have government. And the government shall be upon him. His shoulder. Whose shoulder? The son that is given up in the first part of the verse, which is Jesus of Nazareth. See? All right, now reading on. Now his name, when he comes to be king of kings and lord of lords, his name shall be called Wonderful, Consular, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father. See, he's God in total. And he's the Prince of Peace. Now verse 7, the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end. In other words, it's going to be total in control of God's planet Earth as well, I think, the whole universe, but whatever. And there shall be no end because, like I've already said, it's going to slip right on into eternity. Now look where he's going to rule from, the throne 
of David. Now we've said it a hundred times on this program, where was David's throne? Mount Zion in Jerusalem, see? And that's exactly where he's going to set up his rule and reign when he returns. He's going to rule from Mount Zion in Jerusalem. All right, now read on. And he's going to order it. He's going to establish it with judgment. Now the word judgment as it's used in this vein is not meeting out punishment. The word judgment means righteous rule. Always remember that. That when you see the word judgment in this kind of a setting, it's not sentencing people. It is a righteous, godly rule. <clears throat> All right, so he's going to establish it with a godly rule, with justice from henceforth forever, and the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform it. All right, now let's go a little further in the Old Testament and let's jump up to Zechariah, the next to last book in the Old Testament. And these are all portions I know we've used before in previous programs, but we'll keep repeating them because this is mandatory to understand the end time scenario. <clears throat> this is what everything is moving forward to, is the return of Christ and the setting up of his kingdom. Now this doesn't pertain so much to you and I as members of the body of Christ. This is the promise made to Israel. They are the ones that are looking forward to this glorious kingdom. All right, now let's just take our time and jump in Zechariah 14 and see what has to precede the coming in of this glorious heaven on earth kingdom. Verse 1 of Zechariah 14. Zechariah 14, verse 1. Behold, the day of the Lord cometh. Now the unskilled Bible reader <clears throat> doesn't really know what that means. But those of you who have heard me teach long enough, you know that the day of the Lord is the tribulation. Those final seven years, again from Daniel's prophecy, where it's going to be the most horrible period of time the world has ever experienced. And it's called the day of the Lord. Judgment, wrath, punishment. All right? So the day of the Lord cometh, thy spoil shall be divided in the midst of thee. In other words, Israel is going to be overrun by her enemies. Now verse 2. For God will sovereignly gather all nations against Jerusalem. Now let's compare Scripture with Scripture. Stop right there. Jump ahead to Matthew 24 and the words of the Lord Jesus Himself. Matthew 24. Keep your hand in uh, Zechariah. We'll come right back. Matthew 24. And here is a chapter that is all tribulation ground. Everything he speaks of is going to take place once that final seven years kicks in. All right, you're going to come down to verse 7. Just for, you can jump in almost any place, but let's just jump in at verse 7. Matthew 24, Jesus is speaking. For nation shall rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom, there will be famines and pestilences, earthquakes in diverse places. Now, this all sounds familiar, doesn't it? But we're not there yet. Even though we're seeing a lot of this, it isn't this prophecy yet being fulfilled. It's going to be far, far worse than anything we're seeing today. Even though all of this is telling the world that we're coming closer and closer. All right? Then verse 8, all these... These disasters and catastrophes are just the what? The beginning. This is just the beginning of what? Sorrows. Now, some of your newer translations may have travail because it's a reference to the woman approaching childbirth or delivery. The world or the earth is approaching the delivery from the curse. And the only way God can bring it about is to bring in this utter devastation upon Christ rejecting mankind. So all of these phenomena 
far worse than anything we've seen today, are just the beginning. All right, now verse 9. And once it starts, like the woman approaching delivery, then Jesus says, and remember he's speaking to the twelve who are representative of the nation of Israel. Then he says, they shall deliver you, that is the Jewish people. They will deliver you up to be afflicted. They will kill you. Sound familiar? Hitler all over again, only worse. You shall be hated of, what's the term? All the nations. There won't be a single nation on earth that will come to Israel's defense like we would today. Even America will lose that opportunity of helping Israel. All the nations of the world will turn against them. All right, and you will be hated of all nations for my name's sake. And then it goes on, of course, until finally in verse 21, Jesus puts the capstone on all these prophetic events. For then, Jesus said, shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, in other words, when he's speaking there in 28, 29 A.D., nor ever shall be. This is going to be the most horrible seven-year period in all of human history. And the world just laughs at the thought of it. But I'm here to tell them it's going to happen because God's Word has mandated it. All right, now then, let's go back to Zechariah. And now here is what Jesus was making reference to. This prophecy right here, verse 2, where all the nations of the world will be gathered against Jerusalem to battle for war, not for peace, not a road map. This is for a total destruction of the Jewish people. All right? The women shall, or the houses shall be rifled or ransacked. The women ravished or raped, it's going to be worse than anything you've ever seen or heard of. And half the city, that is Jerusalem, remember, will go into captivity. They'll be overrun by these Gentile hordes. And the rest of the people shall not be cut off from the city. In other words, it's going to be a total, total mayhem for the, nation, uh, for the city of Jerusalem. And then verse 3 before it is totally consummated, before the Jews are totally destroyed, then, you remember I'm always pointing out time words? At that precise moment, now we don't know the day, the month, or the year, but God does, but there will come a time when the Lord, Jesus Christ, God the Son, Israel's Messiah, Jesus of Nazareth, however you want to look at Him, then shall the Lord go forth and fight against those nations. When all the nations of the world have come to the Middle East with the sole purpose of destroying and removing the Jewish people, God will intervene. And He is going to come in what we call the Second Coming, and it's going to be with wrath and destruction, and He's going to come as when they fought in the day of battle. All right, now when all that is consummated, and the enemies have been totally destroyed. Now verse 4. And his feet. In other words, he's going to return bodily, physically, visibly, just like he left from the Mount of Olives in Acts chapter 1. And his feet will stand in that same Mount of Olives that's in Jerusalem today. And his feet will stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem on the east. The Mount of Olives shall cleave or separate in the middle thereof to form a great river valley that will go from the Mediterranean to the Dead Sea. All right, and the Mount of Olives shall cleave in the midst thereof toward the east and to the west, and there shall be a great valley. Half the mountain shall be moved to the north, half to the south. And then you pick it up in verse 8. After this valley is formed, going right through the middle of Mount of Olives, headed out to the Dead Sea, it will create a great river of supernaturally fresh water. It's going to be so supernaturally fresh that it will clean up the Dead Sea. 
All right, now verse 8. And it shall be in that day when Christ returns to Jerusalem that living water shall go out from Jerusalem half to the former sea, that is, out to the Mediterranean, and half toward the hinder sea, which is the Dead Sea, in summer and in winter it shall be. But now here is the capstone again. Verse 9. This is the final result of all this. And the Lord shall be king over what? All the earth, not just Israel, not just Jerusalem. He's going to be king of kings and Lord of lords over the whole planet. And his name shall be one. And so this is the whole prophetic picture then of the coming of the kingdom of heaven. All right, now let's just jump up to Acts a minute. I forestalled going because I thought I'd run out of time. But let's go to Acts chapter 1 and pick up that same kind of language. Acts chapter 1. We looked at this verse in the last program, but let's look at it again. Where Jesus and the eleven are now meeting at the end of his time on earth, and he's ready to ascend back to glory. And verse 6, Wherefore they said, or when they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? Now what kingdom did they have in their mind? Solomon, see what glory for Israel. Is Israel again ready to have that kind of a kingdom? Well, Jesus' answer was, it's not for you to know when, he didn't say it wasn't going to happen. He just said it's not for you to know when, the time or the season, but it will come. All right, now then, let's go over quickly to verse 9. As they're standing on the Mount of Olives, talking about things pertaining to this coming kingdom, verse 9, when he had spoken these things, and while they beheld, or while they watched, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight, and now verse 10, while they looked steadfastly, two men or two angels stood by them in white apparel. And now look what the angels told them, exactly what Zechariah just got through telling us. Why stand gazing up into heaven this same Jesus, as you have seen go into heaven in his resurrected body, shall so come in like manner as what? as you have seen him go into heaven. Thank you for watching Through the Bible with Les Feldick. Through the Bible is a partner-supported ministry. If this program has been a help to your study of the scriptures and you'd like to see others enjoy the teaching, your support would be greatly appreciated. Write to us at Les Feldick Ministries, 30706 West Lona Valley Road, Kenta, Oklahoma, 74552, or call 1-800-369-7856. Remember, all programs are available in printed form, audio cassette, and videotape. Be sure to tune in next time to Through the Bible with Les Feldick.